Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Coordinator here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you here for today's webinar, Respons Responding Inclusively to Coronavirus, with presenter Rafi El Aladina of Frost Included. This is the first in a special two-part presentation on DEI during this global pandemic um, presented to you by Frost Included. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. Today, Rafi will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Due to recent security issues, the chat will not be opened, so please utilize the Q&A to ask any questions. At the end of this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We tr truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible. Um, the activities IDs will be provided at the end of this webinar. It is also being recorded and being broadcast live on Facebook. Uh, the recording to, will be posted to the website within the next week, along with these slides. Visit our website, forumworkplaceinclusion.org, or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn um, for, for more information. Uh, before I hand things over to Rafi, I just like to hand I just like to, to hand things over to our executive director Steve for Steve Hummerkhaus for a brief message. Hello, everyone. I am indeed Steve Hummerkhaus, the executive director of the Forum for Place Inclusion. Like so many of us in this new virtual world, I'm speaking today from my home in North Minneapolis. As you may know, the forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. During regular times, we provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. During these first times, we're working even harder to present more programming for you, including some specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our workplaces, ourselves, and especially underserved populations. Of course, this webinar is uh, the, uh, one of those uh, special featured webinars that we're providing. We provide most of our resources, like this webinar, for free. We're able to do this thanks to the generous support of our community. We know these resources have great value to you since so many of you regularly participate, and we're so grateful that many of our virtual offerings are full beyond capacity. Like many other organizations, we are experiencing challenges due to the pandemic. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation to our website and to each podcast and webinar page. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of this service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI training to you and for us to fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible. Thank you for support, your support of the Forum on Workplace Inclusion, and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you for that message, Steve, and thank you for your leadership during this time. Um, without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Rafi. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate that introduction, and thank you so much, Steve, for putting on this series of um, webinars and podcasts, and for all that you do. Uh, around in, uh, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion around the world, especially in a time like right now, where coronavirus is making everything a little bit more difficult for all of us. Um, so uh, as Ben mentioned, my name is Rafi Aladina. Thank you so much for joining for this webinar. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to talk about this issue uh, the topic for today, as Ben mentioned, is responding inclusively to coronavirus. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background about why I'm here, uh, my name is Rafi and I am a consultant with Frost Included. Uh, FI is a diversity and inclusion consultancy based in London, UK, uh, but we work all around the world. And in my capacity as a consultant, I've worked with clients from almost every continent. Uh, I only have two left, one of which is Antarctica, so I'm getting there pretty quickly. Um, but we've worked around the world uh, with companies from uh, the public sector, the private sector, 
uh, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, uh, and philanthropic foundations, uh, trying to help them improve the way that they do diversity and inclusion within their companies. Uh, part of that has been through workshops and webinars and trainings. Uh, some of that is through helping with, um, with analyzing their policies and procedures. Uh, but other things are more into where my background comes in, uh, which was in academia. And so um, I do a lot of work around behavioral change and behavioral economics, as well as in statistics and how you actually measure inclusion in organizations. So you'll get a little bit of a taste of that particular background when we go through this, as I'll be focusing later on on um, nudges or behavioral economics interventions that we can use to try and be more inclusive, particularly in this trying time. So one of the questions that I think we really need to answer is why does diversity and inclusion matter now? So a lot of the organizational leaders that we've worked with are asking this question. You know, they've they say, we've got this massive public health crisis. Our organizations are struggling to stay afloat. Why should we be caring about DNI right now? Don't we have bigger issues to be worrying about? So, you know, we talk to them, and when we look at the data about what leaders and organizations feel they need to focus on, particularly right now, this is the kind of thing they're saying that in adapting to this COVID 19 crisis, they need to inspire more creativity and innovation out of their companies. They need to connect with employees on a personal level. They need to help people work more efficiently and productively. And they need to aid in the maintenance of health and safety of their colleagues. And these are the key points that companies are caring about. And it's really this last one about health and safety that seems to be the priority for everyone. Now, it's really easy not to be inclusive right now. When we think about why diversity and inclusion is so hard for many of us, it's in part because our biases are instinctual. They are parts of our system one processes. They are things that are uh, more quick reactionary decisions versus our system two, which is more slow and reasoned. Biases fall into that first category of system one. And when people are under instances of what we call high cognitive load, so when they're tired, when they're hungry, when they're stressed, when they're under a lot of time pressure, all of those things impact our ability to shift from our system one instinctual behaviors to our system two more slow reasoned thinking. And right now we're in a point where system one is on full blast, I, especially because we're just trying to adapt to this kind of a crisis. But the truth is, DNI can help us attain these goals that that companies and leaders have outlined as being really important to them. So while it's probably easier now than ever to not be inclusive and not focus on DNI, right now might be the best time to really do so. Because while DNI can help us attain these goals, a lack of it can have real dire consequences. For example, um, if you are from an ethnic minority group, you might have noticed that when you go to an airport or a restaurant or something like that that has automatic faucets and taps in the bathrooms, uh, you might have noticed that you have to get your hands in the perfect place for it to work properly. And maybe you, maybe you notice that this is not necessarily the case for your white friends. Maybe you have. But the fact is that the reason is because um, automatic faucets and taps, particularly ones that were, that were invented um, years ago and are a little bit older, are based on an object detection system that is more effective at detecting white objects than dark objects. This is because when coding these object detection systems that are used in these automatic faucets and taps, the training set that's used to train the machine to learn about it really only contained 
pictures of white people's hands and white skin. It didn't have that much of skin tones of other colors. As a result, they, the machine learned to be more effective at detecting white skin than dark skin. And, you know, that can be a little annoying. It can mean that, you know, you do have to put your hands in the perfect place and it's irritating sometimes, but it's not the worst thing in the world. The problem is when you start applying this to other products, for example, with self-driving cars. Research by the University of Georgia a couple of years ago showed that the self-driving cars uh, object detection systems were similar to those for automatic taps. And that these cars were, as a result, worse at detecting light objects than they were at dark objects. So self-driving cars, when they were starting to be deployed, as they already have been in places like Pittsburgh as a beta test for Uber self-driving cars, they were more likely to hit dark-skinned pedestrians than light-skinned ones. It didn't mean they would hit it every time. It just meant that the reaction time of the car was a little bit slower because it didn't recognize the darker object. Now, having an automatic faucet not be perfect is a little bit annoying. But when it comes to automatic cars, it can be a matter of life and death. And if the training set had a little bit more uh, dark skinned objects in there, dark skinned people in there, then maybe it would be a little bit better at detecting those objects. And maybe um, the part of the reason for that is because the diversity of the team that was coding that object detection system wasn't that diverse. Or worse yet, it was diverse, but those people didn't feel like they could speak up and say that, hey, there's no one who looks like me in the training set, and that could cause a problem. Now, this wasn't just true of people with different skin tones. They also found that, uh, that these object detection systems were worse at detecting pregnant people, obese people, people who were pushing strollers, and bicyclists who were carrying lots of objects, say, on a rear bicycle rack or a front basket. If we don't have diversity in the team that's coding these systems, it can lead to more deaths of particular groups of people in a systematic way. And that's something we desperately need to avoid. It's not just true when it comes to products, though. This happens also in the criminal justice system. In Florida, um, the criminal justice system started using an algorithm called Compass to try and understand what are the likelihoods that certain people who committed crimes would commit a crime again. So what is the likelihood that someone who is convicted of a criminal offense, how likely are they to recidivate? And judges were using this algorithm to help them determine the, the length of sentences for these people who had committed crimes. What they found, what ProPublica found after investigating this algorithm was that a lot of the uh, variables that were included were actually more highly correlated with race than they were with anything else, with the actual ability to recidivate. And so what resulted were that black criminals were getting longer sentences than white criminals for the exact same crime uh, and that and that kind of racism was just being perpetuated by an algorithm that they that the Florida justice system thought would help equalize the playing field. This is something that we desperately need to avoid. And if there were more people who were able to voice their opinions and say, "Hey, these variables are not really about um, are are not really about recidivating or criminal activity." they're really just about, uh, about being black, then maybe we, would have, we wouldn't have run into that problem to begin with. Thankfully, after ProPublica came out with this study, the Florida justice system did cancel the use of this, but they are still refining this further. And diversity and inclusion will be key to refining this in a way that's actually usable. Another example that you might remember is from Google. A number of years ago, they started using their um, reverse image search platform. 
This was a way for people to input an image so that they could get words that describe what was in the picture. In their beta test, um, people then began to notice when this started launching that Google's reverse image would start tagging black people in pictures as gorillas. Now this made a lot of fanfare. And as a result, Google just decided to take out the object detection system for, or the, the take out the reverse image detection for gorillas entirely. And that was their solution for it. But the reason for this, as they discovered later on, was because the people who were coding the, the reverse image search platform, when they were coding pictures of human beings, they just put pictures from their own lives. And it just happened that the majority of the coders on this team were East Asian or white. And so they were taking pictures from their own lives of other East Asian and white people for the majority of those pictures. This meant that the algorithm used to determine what these pictures look like could not identify the difference between black people and gorillas. So a little bit more diversity on that team would definitely have helped. It's not just about tech though. When we think about mortgage lending, we know that people are more biased against different racial groups, but we also know that they're more biased against women as well. This is because there is a subconscious perception that uh, women, when they are the breadwinners of the household, um, are, are more likely to leave their jobs, particularly when they get pregnant and start having children. Now, whether or not this is actually true, the point is that a lot of mortgage lenders subconsciously believe it to be true. And so they believe that as time goes on, um, the, the family will have less disposable income because the breadwinner, the woman, will no longer, uh, will no longer be the breadwinner. And so the family will be having a little bit less money. As a result, uh, lots of research in the last number of years has shown that families with the where a woman is a breadwinner have been receiving higher interest rates than other places. And if there are more, and the fact is that most mortgage lenders are still men. So we need that diversity of thought in, in these organizations to make sure that these kinds of, this kind of discrimination doesn't happen. It also happens in healthcare. So another example is, uh, is with heart attacks. For the longest time, everyone believed that there were very specific symptoms uh, for heart attacks. It could be the shooting pain up and down your left arm, the tightness in your chest, the shortness of breath. And people believed, you know, you see that, that's what a heart attack is. The problem is they were only asking men. No, the fact is that women have actually very different symptoms for heart attacks and we're only really discovering this now. As a result of though, that, that focus on male symptoms, most heart attack medication, it turns out that we're discovering only in the last five years or so, is really actually only effective for men and not effective for women. Clinical trials in pharmaceutical companies need to be more diverse and more inclusive of different groups of people because we don't know necessarily how different drugs will react with different people. One example of where this has been particularly bad is with pacemakers. If you watch the Netflix TV show Explained by Vox, their episode on computing talks about an example of a pregnant woman who has a pacemaker. Now, for those of you who, those of you may know that a pacemaker's job is to reg regulate an irregular heartbeat by giving a small electric shock to the heart. Whenever it detects that there is a murmur, it just gives a little bit of a shock to put the heartbeat back into, into a regular rhythm. Those of you who have ever been pregnant or know about pregnancy may, re may remember that heart murmurs and irregular heartbeats are actually incredibly common among pregnant people. But the most popular pacemaker used in the US was never tested on pregnant women, and pregnant women were not part of the decision-making group when looking at how to test these pacemakers. As a result, the woman in this particular episode of the show that I described 
was talking about how because she had a heart defect, she had a pacemaker, but when she got pregnant, she started getting heart murmurs, which happens in about 75% of pregnant people. And she started getting electric shocks, which I don't need to tell you is probably not something that pregnant people want to have. And so it's really important that diversity and inclusion is incorporated into the very way we do our regular day-to-day -day work. Without it, we can have these dire consequences of people dying, people being discriminated against for housing, and people being discriminated against in all other sorts of ways. The problem is that even when diversity is present, if we don't have inclusion, it still doesn't work. This is an example I want to provide from GitHub, which is a major coding website where people post issues that they're having with code and other people can post solutions for them. So on GitHub, about 79% of pull requests, which are major changes to open source code that were made by women were approved, whereas 74% of those made by men were approved. This is only true when nobody knows the gender of the coder. However, as soon as people are made aware of the gender of who is writing that code, everything, everything switches. Only 62% of the changes made by women get approved compared to 65% of those made by men. So when things are gender blind, people realize that women's code is actually objectively better on average for this particular site. But people are still more willing to trust the code of men. So even when people know that a woman has written the code, they're less likely to approve it, even if it is objectively better. This kind of discrimination, so even when diversity is present, if inclusion isn't there, that discrimination will stand. And then we won't have all these benefits. And believe me, there are a lot of benefits when DNI pre is present. One obvious example that helps a lot of companies really get on board with DNI is the fact that there is an increase in revenue gain. So going from an office that's either all male or all female to an office split equally between the sexes is associated with a revenue gain of 41%. Unfortunately, there is very little data about uh, the inclusion of people of non-binary genders or of genders that are not male or female. And that's a really big dearth in the academic literature. But that's something that I think organizations and academics are working on to increase the data there. Other benefits are around solving complex problem solving tasks, where diverse teams are 33% more likely to find the correct answer. In, additionally, when diversity is present, collective intelligence tends to increase as well, increasing the group's average IQ at, a, at five times the rate or increase, increasing performance at five times the rate of increasing the average IQ. And of course, we have the oft-cited McKinsey study that showed that the top quartile of gender diversity had financial returns 15% above the national industry median. For, for ethnic diversity, that number was actually 30%. But these benefits of diversity do not work when inclusion is not also present. Academic research in the last five years, particularly the work of Shindir Dillon, has shown that diversity without inclusion just doesn't work. And in fact, sometimes diversity can make things even harder when inclusion isn't present. The benefits of diversity are only realized when inclusion is truly embedded in the very fabric of the way we work. When it is present though, that increases the perception that diversity is valued. And a 20% increase in employee perception that diversity is valued is associated with increases in cooperation, job satisfaction, and indeed in workplace morale. So let's think about the specific inclusion issues around this pandemic. We mentioned earlier that organizations are really wanting to focus on innovation and creativity. And that makes a lot of sense because people are in a time of crisis, people are in a time of adaptation, people are being forced to work in ways that they never have really before. And so it makes sense that they want to increase innovation and creativity. Research by Phyllis and Dylan, who I mentioned before, 
has shown that inclusion programs where both high and low status employees feel included in the workplace are more likely to suggest these innovative ideas and be more productive. Now, when I talk about high and low status employees, this is a really important factor. Often when we work with our organizations, we find that there is a bit of a disconnect between leadership and lower level employees in their perceptions of how inclusive the organization is. It is critical for inclusion to work and for diversity to work and for us to realize the benefits that diversity can really bring that everybody across all levels of the organization feel included. And uh, this is something that needs to be made clear because without the lower level employees feeling, feeling included, then you actually don't get these benefits. Additionally, to increase innovation and creativity, organizations need to increase psychological safety. Psychological safety is a concept that uh, was coined by Amy Edmondson back in 1999. And it really critically looks at how safe do people feel to be vulnerable, to be open, and to take chances with their teams and their organizations. It answers questions that, like, do you feel like you can disagree with your boss without a feel of fear of backlash? Can you express dissent with the prevailing opinion in a team without being ridiculed or being ostracized? Can you make a mistake without it being unreasonably held over you? Or do you feel like there is opportunity to be creative with solutions? Having a culture where employees feel psychologically safe means that they're more willing to try and take chances and suggest alternative points of view. And that can lead to much better solutions, more creative solutions, greater numbers of solutions, and more accurate predictions in the long run. Another big issue in this pandemic is that people want to try and reduce loneliness and foster better mental health. We mentioned earlier that organizations are saying that the number one issue that they are caring about right now is the health and safety of their employees. And this particularly is important for mental health. Right now, we're seeing a bit of a mental health crisis during this pandemic. Over 50% of the US population has said that their mental health has been negatively affected by the pandemic. And for those who already had a mental health issue, 80% of them have reported that their symptoms have worsened during this crisis. So inclusion can be really, really important because inclusion in your work can reduce stress, reduce anxiety, and increase cooperation and satisfaction and boost morale. Being, being forced into a new working style can be uncomfortable for a lot of people, particularly if they already have issues around anxiety and stress. And this increased anxiety and stress from the pandemic itself and from reading anxiety-inducing news every day can really make it hard to stay focused on work and, to, and can really make it hard to just stay sane during this crisis. So being inclusive during work can really help with in maintaining the health and safety of your employees. Finally, uh, I wanted just to discuss increasing workplace agility. So many organizations, as we said, are trying to improve the productivity and efficiency of their organizations. And we know that from the stats that I've already shown, being more inclusive of flexible working options, for example, can increase productivity and efficiency. This is obviously really important for mental health because um, we know that having, uh, having schedules that really fit with your lifestyle can help maintain your, your mental health. But also this can be really important for getting the most out of people who say have caregiving responsibilities, for example. A lot of people right now are struggling to balance the idea of working full time every day while also now having to homeschool their children, entertain their children, cook for people, and make sure that um, all of their work life is balanced. 
work and life are balanced. And being more inclusive of different flexible working options can really help with that. Traditionally, a lot of work flexibility options have focused on allowing people to leave for appointments or to pick up their kids from school or things like that. But we need to think a little bit more broadly about what it really means to work flexibly. If organizations can make work flexibility the default, then uh, employees will feel a little bit more able to be agile in the way that they work. Maybe they'll take their kids for a walk in the middle of the day and be able to work a little bit later on in the evening. Or maybe they'll just spend a little bit more time cooking a healthy lunch for themselves. Or maybe they'll just take time for themselves to be mindful and meditate or take a walk. These kinds of things can really help with mental health, but can also just really help ha help each other be more productive and more efficient with the way that they work. Another benefit of increased workplace agility and being more uh, inclusive of diverse working lifestyles is that it increases job satisfaction and reduces the war warmth competency effect. The warmth competency effect is a well-documented uh, psychological factor in organizational behavior, where uh, we find that members of minority groups, particularly women and people from ethnic minorities, are, are seen as either warm or competent, but rarely, if ever, both. So an example of a study that has shown this um, was done on Harvard Business School students. Two different classes were given case studies about a, uh, about a venture capitalist named Heidi Roizen or Howard Roizen. Now the case study was the same. The person was extremely effective at their job and had done a great, and had done a great job and had a good track record in the past. And students had to decide, would they want this person on their team for their business? One class got the name Heidi and one class got the name Howard but the cases and the details were exactly the same. When they analyzed the results of the study and to see what these students were saying, they found that with, with Howard, people thought that he was effective, that he was efficient. They thought that he stood, for, stood his ground and knew what he stood for and that they wanted to work with him. And so they would hire him and give him a good salary and they wanted to work with him. With Heidi, on the other hand, though, despite the fact that all of the details were the same, students, uh, students similarly saw that she was effective and thought that she was good at what she did, but they also felt like she wasn't kind and that they didn't want to work with her. And so, as a result, they were less willing to hire her and would give her a lower starting, starting salary. Now, this has been reflected repeatedly in studies all over the world with all different kinds of situations. This is also true of, uh, of negotiations at, around salary or, or around other kinds of issues as well. Most often, we find that when women stand up for themselves, despite the fact that they have good reasons and are seen as competent, they're often described as cold and abrasive, whereas men who use the exact same language are seen as knowing their work and standing up for themselves. When we increase our inclusion of diverse working lifestyles, particularly in a time like this, when people are working virtually, we see this warmth competence effect start to break down. Part of this is because everybody is having to take their share of housework and childcare. And part of it is just because people are willing to be a little bit more generous with the different, um, thing, different things that people are having to balance in their lives. So the question is, if all of this inclusion can be really helpful during this pandemic, what can we do about it? Well, there are a few different approaches that we can take to um, embedding inclusion in our, in our work. The first is something we like to call diversity 101. This is really a compliance-based approach. It's trying to make sure that we just don't get sued. It's making sure that we're following all the equal employment laws and making sure that you know, people aren't going to um, file complaints against us for the way that we're requiring people to work. 
Now this is important, but it's really just a very basic level. The second level is diversity 2.0. And that's really a marketing led approach. It's the idea that people are approaching diversity and inclusion from, from the perspective of, we want people to see us as an inclusive employer rather than we want to be an inclusive employer. So to illustrate this difference, I, I wanna give you an example of the Bechdel test. For those of you who don't know, the Bechdel test is a way of trying to establish whether or not a TV show or movie or book or something like that um, achieves the minimal level of gender equality. To pass this test, this piece of media has to have two or more named female characters who have a conversation with each other about something other than a man. It's pretty basic. And you'd think that it isn't too hard to pass this test. Now, some of you may have heard of the very popular TV show, Game of Thrones. Now, a lot of people have said a lot of things about that show, but one of the reasons that people say that this is a pretty good paragon in some ways of gender equality is that the four, four of the most central and powerful characters in the show are women. You have Daenerys, the mother of dragons, who's striving to get back on the throne. You have Cersei, the queen of the seven kingdoms, who is, who's the royal in charge of, of and trying to, keep, uh, trying to keep power. You have the queen in the north, and then you also have the, uh, the badass assassin, Arya. These four women are central characters and are four of the most powerful characters throughout the series, or at least that's what's argued. So you'd think that it's a pretty gender equal show, at least to some degree. But when you ask, do these shows pass the Bechdel test? We find that not, in not a single season of the show, are, uh, do the majority of episodes pass the Bechdel test, that very basic test of whether or not a show is at least somewhat gender equal. Notably, in season four, not a single episode passed that test. And across the first seven seasons, only 18 of the 67 episodes passed the test. So despite that, on its surface, you might think that there's some level of gender equality because these four central characters are the most powerful and happen to be women, when you get down to it, it really isn't. This is true in organizations as well. In the UK, uh, companies of more than 250 people are required to report their gender pay gaps. And um, we decided to take a look at the Catalyst Award winners, which is an organization that gives awards for gender equality. Um, of the last 10, year winner, 10 years of winners for this award and look at their gender pay gaps and compare them to the rest of the UK. So this green line represents no pay gap at all between, the different gender, between men and women. And this purple line indicates the UK average. What we found is that the vast majority of companies that have been winning these awards for their gender equality are actually doing worse than the average UK company in its gender pay gap. So despite that they might have a lot of flashy things that say that they're good at gender equality, when it gets down to reality about the very basic idea of paying people equally, they're not really doing it. This is what it means to be in diversity 2.0, where you're entirely marketing led, but it's really just surface level stuff that covers up the fact that you're not truly inclusive underneath. That's what we mean when we talk about inclusion 3.0. We're talking about embedding inclusion in the very fabric of the organization, embedding inclusive behaviors in every single thing that we do. Now, there are a number of ways of doing that. It could be larger systemic changes um, so that uh, the policies and procedures you have available to you, like your hiring policies might be anonymized or you make sure you use strictly structured interviews and ask people the same questions in the same order. Or it might be things like day-to-day -day behaviors that you change. And it's those day-to-day -day behaviors that I wanna focus on that we can make more inclusive. One way of affecting this is with something called nudges. Nudges are a behavioral economics technique designed to uh, 
to help people encourage predictably predictable behaviors. So a nudge is something that predictably affects someone's behavior that's easy and cheap to institute and avoid and is not a mandate. So there are all kinds of examples of this, but the idea is that you can institute something, some kind of intervention that you introduce in your life that can predictably affect you to be more inclusive, that's easy and cheap and not a mandate. So I'll give you an example. This is a picture that I took in Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Now, some of you may recognize this image. Some of you may not. And it is a urinal. And you'll see right here that there's an image of a fly painted strategically in a very specific place. Now, it turns out that men like to aim in general on average. And so when they have a, an image of a fly there, strategically placed in the place that is that will create the least amount of splashback, then that's where men will aim. Now, it might seem like a trivial and kind of ridiculous example, but as a result of just painting these little flies in urinals, Amsterdam's airport reduced the amount of time and therefore money spent on cleaning men's bathrooms by 50%. This tiny little instance caused a massive change that had a huge benefit. That's what I mean by a nudge a small thing where you're not forcing anyone to do anything that can create an outsized effect. From an inclusive perspective, I'll give you an example now. This is something that we did in the London 2012 Olympics. So in the Olympics, we had uh, different people sign a leadership pledge about trying to be as inclusive as possible in the way that they would work. And once they signed this pledge, this was these copies of this pledge were then hung around the office space. That way people could see it and remember to be inclusive when they, when they needed to. And the idea was that people want to be inclusive when they can, they just keep forgetting. So if we can have people remember and we can remind them of being inclusive, whether that's by, when they walk by the kitchen, or when they go to make lunch, or when they're go going up and down in an elevator, or just walking through the halls and they see this, they're reminded of what they committed themselves to. And having that reminder can be really powerful to help people be inclusive in the decisions they're making. So thinking about what some of these nudges for inclusion could be during specifically this pandemic, I have a few ideas that I'd like to present to you. The first one is about encouraging everyone to have virtual backgrounds. One of the trends that we're seeing across the world right now is that because everybody is doing virtual working from their home, we're seeing people on Zoom chats like this one or other kinds of platforms where their housing background is behind them. Now, younger people, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, have been reporting that they feel a little bit embarrassed sometimes to show what their houses look like. Maybe they have multiple roommates, or maybe they don't have a dedicated office space and are working from a kitchen or their bedroom. And that can cause a little bit of anxiety and people are just less willing to turn on their videos or feel really nervous about turning them on when they are forced to. So one way to kind of equalize the playing field is to encourage everyone to have virtual backgrounds. It takes the pressure off of those people who may have a little bit of money or may have anxiety about where they're having to broadcast from, but it also creates a more collegial atmosphere where people can learn a little bit more about why they chose the virtual background they chose and add a little bit of whimsy into the discussion. Another, another nudge that we can do is to try and encourage schedules. Having really specific schedules has been shown to reduce stress and anxiety in people all over the world. So when I'm talking about schedules, I'm talking about things like scheduling very specific snack times or specific time for, to read news, and importantly, the specific time for doing work. So don't work outside of your work hours. And as a leader or manager, you need to model this. And by modeling this, you can show your reports that you're really serious about it. 
So don't send emails outside of your work hours. Turn off those work notifications on your phone and shut that laptop. Having these very specific schedules and expressing them to your direct reports and just expressing them to any of your colleagues can really help others feel like it's okay for them to do it too and give them ideas to try and reduce that stress and anxiety. For myself, I obviously have these specific times for work, but for the time for reading news was really important. I found that for myself, reading news constantly was giving me a lot of anxiety because I just kept getting stressed out about increased numbers of, of coronavirus patients and deaths uh, across the world or in my specific city where I'm based in Philadelphia and where my family's based in Northern Alberta. And so what was really helpful for me was saying that, okay, I'm only going to read or listen to or watch the news between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. It meant that even when news notifications came up on my phone or someone tagged me in a news piece that they wanted to share with me, I knew that I had specific times to read them, specific times to look at them, and that way I wouldn't feel as pressured to look at them right away. And this kind of started to reduce the anxiety I was feeling rather than constantly throughout the day, it was housing it in these specific periods of time, and I still felt like I was remaining informed. A few more examples of what we can do are encouraging even more flexible working. So, and, and I mentioned this earlier about making sure we're having flexible working for things that aren't just those traditional things that people accept, like appointments. Taking that time to be flexible about taking naps or taking walks or anything like that can be really, really helpful for including a lot of different people who may have different work styles or may find that they're more efficient when they work during different hours. Another one in particular for during this pandemic is to check in on carers. People with caregiving responsibilities are being particularly taxed right now because they've just got a lot more demands on, on their time than they used to. So as a manager or leader, or even just as a colleague, check in on their health and stress, make sure they're doing okay, and work with them to arrange an easier work-life balance. And this includes creating uh, more inclusive meeting times or work hours in general for these people. The final point I wanna bring up as an idea is really just showing vulnerability. When it comes to creating a truly inclusive environment, trust is key. But trust has to start from somewhere. And as a leader, it's important that you role model that trust first. If you're able to open up about issues you might be having with your own mental health right now, or other struggles you might be having with balancing your own work and life, or, or any other personal ideas or or work struggles that you might be having, showing that vulnerability, open, opening up to your colleagues can really create that environment of psychological safety that is critical to helping people be more innovative, be more productive, be more efficient, and really just feel safe. At the end of the day, when we think about what it means for different people to be included here, Diversity is just kind of a reality, but inclusion, that's a choice. And it's a choice that we actively have to make if we want to thrive during this crisis. Thank you so much. I'll stop there. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, you can reach out on our website. You can email me at the email address right there, or you can find us on Twitter at Frost Included or on LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook and all those kinds of different platforms. Um, I'll open it now to questions. Thank you so much, Rafi, for that wonderful uh, webinar and a great kickoff to this uh, special two-part um, pro program that we're offering. Um, well, yeah, let's just jump right into questions. It's, uh, it's uh, first one, is psychological safety a tool to create more inclusion or a product of an inclusive culture? I think it's a combination of both, quite honestly. Um, and if you if you're if you go on Google Scholar, you can actually find the um, original paper by Amy Edmondson. It was published in 1999, and that original paper actually has the psychological safety scale that you can use to measure the safety of your own organization. Um, 
Now, it's not comprehensive and it's not necessarily updated or the perfect language for your organization, but it can give you an idea of what you're really looking for. Psychological safety is both an inspiration for more inclusion and a product of more inclusion. It's kind of a bit of both, but you need to start somewhere. Uh, this next one. Uh, I have heard from a couple African-American women that virtual backgrounds don't work well with black hair. Mm. That's really interesting. I, uh, I actually haven't heard that before, but um, I believe that that's quite possible. I mean, it goes back to the issues that we were talking about before, about how object detection systems in automatic taps and self-driving cars are also bad at, at that kind of thing. So I, I suspect that that's still a problem. Um, I, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say, I, I rarely ever do this, but I, as you know, I use virtual backgrounds quite a bit. And I have dark hair, and I can attest that you can actually still see dark hair with that. I'm just going to, again, this is very rare that I ever do this, but just so you can see how a virtual background shows up on someone with dark hair. But anyway, so I will hand, hand things back over to you, and we'll continue to with the questions. How can we balance this, balance this as a leader with the young children, balance our work and family. Yeah, I think as a leader with young children, it's, it's still very difficult, just like it is for any colleague that has young children. And I think part of that is just being really open and having those conversations with your colleagues about how you can balance that work and that life. Um, I think one of the critical things that I'm seeing is that leaders are being much more open than they may maybe have in the past with their colleagues and with their direct reports. And I think that when you, when a leader really expresses their difficulties that they're having, um, employees are a much more generous about it, about trying to help them balance that, and also are much more open themselves and more willing to work together to find solutions that will work for everyone. So I think the leaders taking that first step to be open about the, the struggles that they're having can really be critical. Thank you. And um, next question, gender and ethnic diversity is not really in the most, it's not a reality in most senior leadership teams. Is diversity really a reality everywhere? I think that it depends on how you're thinking about diversity. I think on some dimensions um, in some organizations that might not, that might not be the case. You might not have a lot of ethnic diversity or gender diversity in particular at the top of organizations. I think throughout, if you look at you know, the entire organization more broadly will see that. But I think it's also important to think about other dimensions of diversity as well. Um, and that includes things like disability or neurodiversity or, um, or diversity by uh, personality traits like introversion and extroversion. Now that still might not be the case in any particular organization, but I think generally speaking, I would argue that yeah, diversity is reality if we broaden our ideas of what diversity really is. That doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on increasing diversity of those very important demographics like gender and ethnicity. But it does mean that, I, that it, it, the point is trying to approach people as individuals who, who have their individual differences. Thank you. And how does D and I translate into equity or an equitable organization? Can you share an example? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, I think one, one good example that we've used um, is with an organization we work with called the Welcome Trust. Uh, so the Welcome Trust, for those of you who don't know, is uh, an organization based in London, and it's the world's second largest funder of health and science research, uh, second after the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We did a bit of work with them to, to analyze their, the inclusiveness of their culture. And one of the findings that we had was that, um, that particularly disabled employees felt like they couldn't take advantage of their work flexibility policy because they felt like it would be held against them when it time came for promotion and it would inhibit their ability to grow in the firm. Now, what we decided to implement as a result from a diversity and inclusion standpoint was simply to make work flexibility the default there. And that just meant that rather than people having to request a work flexibility arrangement, Instead, managers had to justify if they wanted someone to work at specific times of day or from specific locations. 
that meant that uh, disabled employees at this organization ended up feeling more comfortable taking time for themselves and for their appointments and using that flexible working. But what was really great is that it actually had an outsized effect uh, to the entire company. And so this was really important for people who had caregiving responsibilities as well. So it's much more important for things like that right now. One of the, I think one of the off-sited um, images uh, that gets spread around is, uh, to show the difference between equality and equity is, you know, those, those people, one tall and one short, who are trying to look over a wooden fence to watch a baseball game. And equality is when they each get one crate to stand on so they can try and look over the fence. And the tall person can look over the fence with only one crate, but the short person can't. And so equity is when the tall person gets one crate, but the short person gets two crates. So they can also see over the fence because they need a little bit of extra help. They're not starting from the same standing point. But the addition that I've seen to this image is just either removing the fence entirely or putting up a barbed wire or a, sorry, not a barbed wire, but a wire fence rather than a wooden one so that everybody can see through it. And that's what it means to eliminate the systemic problem to begin with. And so while I think that um, we definitely need that kind of inclusion side to increase equity and to think about what are the particular needs of individual people and approaching inclusion from that perspective so that that gets embedded, we also need to think about what are the systemic changes that we can embed in our organization so that we remove the need for those uh, those kinds of interventions entirely. Great, thank you. Uh, there, uh, this, there are different points of view to call out culture. What are your recommendations and ideas for creating positive conversations and engagement with colleagues or organizations who are not informed by these inclusive strategies, especially right now? Yeah, I think this is a really difficult one. Um, it's a it's an issue that we have with a lot of with a lot of our clients is that you know people just aren't aware about these issues. Um, I think that there are kind of a few things. One is you know a willingness to be vulnerable and start that conversation, but the second one is really just the fact that a lot of the people who are starting these conversations are um, are people from minority groups themselves. And the truth is that it just shouldn't be on them to have those conversations, to start those conversations. It's, it's not their job to do so. And so I think it's really incumbent on allies of those groups uh, to, to start those conversations themselves. Um, one of the things, one of the techniques that we employ in, our, in our, the organizations that we've worked with that I think is really effective is something called partnering. And so the idea is that when you're in, say, a meeting, um, and you and we know that in meetings, you know, people from different minority groups are more likely to get interrupted or have their ideas attributed to other people. Um, so the idea is that, say, Ben, you and I are partners. Um, if I notice that um, you are getting interrupted, it's my job to call it out in the rest of the meeting. That way, it's not on you to try and stand up for yourself, which can um, for a for a minority group is often seen as a, as a selfish act. Whereas if I'm standing up for you, people see that as something that's justified because it's someone else doing it. And in, and, um, in exchange, you would do the same for me. It also means we're not having to try and watch out for it for everyone. There's not one person responsible to try and call out these exclusive behaviors all of the time. And that way we can just help one another. So making sure that everybody has their individual partners and being very explicit that this is something that we're trying to employ in the organization and that we're going to use in our meetings can really start, uh, can really help to start those conversations and inspire people to be a little bit more open to the fact that maybe their biases are coming into play more than they might like. Thank you again. And we are coming close to the, um, to the t our end time here. So I'm going to have just have time for a couple more. Um, but if we don't get your question answered, please don't worry. You can, as you can see, Rafi's contact information is on the screen. Please feel free to contact him and follow up with any questions if they don't get answered now. Um, or just let him know how much you love the webinar. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, do you have any suggestions on getting managers' attention? Um, they seem. <clears throat> 
to think D and I is not as important because we are in a crisis. Any talking points to help with the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think if the thing that we've seen really work the best is really just providing them the data, being able to show that, hey, you know, it, right now, if you want your company to thrive, you need to be more creative and being inclusive and being diverse is what will allow you to be more creative and innovative right now. Or, you know, people are saying that their revenues might be lower. Well, diversity and inclusion is associated with these increased revenues. So having that data to hand to show them that, to just bombard them with the evidence can be really effective in getting their attention. What helps them, what we found that helps them actually do something about it though, is combining that data with actual real stories and anecdotes from within the organization about how they're not being inclusive right now and how they need to be better um, and to get the most out of their people. So that might be quotes from different peoples um, that you found from engagement surveys and things like that about whether or not people are inclusive. The other thing that I would recommend is trying to conduct an inclusion survey of your population, um, of your workforce. And so, while that might include qualitative questions, if you're able to do a quantitative measure of inclusion, uh, measuring things like psychological safety and like transparency and objectivity in decision making, like the how often people experience microaggressions and disaggregate that by demographic groups and regress that data against uh, outcomes that we know are important to, em to employers like job satisfaction and perceptions of team effectiveness, you can really help show leadership that these things are having a real effect on their organizations and that if we don't change these inclusive behaviors then we are not going to be able to live up to our potential as an, as a, a company ben are you still there i'm sorry i muted myself Sorry, I had muted myself. So this is going to be the last question, but what should we be thinking about and preparing for to ensure equity as we begin returning to our physical workspaces? That's a really important question. And I think um, Steve, Steve Frost, my, my colleague, uh, will be touching on this in the next iteration of this series quite a bit. So this is a good transition point. Um, but I think one of the things we're going to see is that um, people have now gotten a taste for what it means to work from home. And maybe they're not gonna to wanna to do it all the time, but I think one of the biggest things we're gonna see is that work flexibility is going to be much more common. And so I think as we come back to work, I think it'll be really important for people to acknowledge that we can work a lot more flexibly than we might've originally thought. And that people are, people sh and trying to encourage people to feel more open to express their desire to do that if they have it, will be really, really useful for helping people feel more included as we go forward. Perfect, thank you so much. And that was a perfect tr transition um, towards our end here. I would just wanna thank you again, Rafi, for this uh, for this wonderful webinar and for and for Frost included for providing this special webinar um, mini series for us. And I just wanna thank everybody who participated today. And um, again, yeah, thank you to Frost included. As promised, the SHRM activity ID for this webinar is the 20-RVVPY, uh, and the HRCI activity ID is 522280. Those are the activity IDs to receive uh, continuing education unit credits for this webinar. Um, the, the, I will say that the, the HRCI is still in pending, so it might be a little bit before you can enter that. Um, that, num that number and receive the credits, but we should be able to shortly. But and as, me as Rafi mentioned, uh, next week we will be doing the second part of the special presentation, uh, Inclusive Leadership in a Virtual World with the Stephen Frost of Frost Included on Thursday, May 7th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And new, and new episodes of the Forum podcast are now also available. Visit forumworkplaceinclusion.org forward slash podcast to listen, or you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar, and we hope you will join us for future webinars. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you.